Yeah, so thank you for the introduction. Um, just a little bit more about us and our, and our thoughts, and hopefully, as we say, we'll try and set it up for the afternoon and the session. Um, my name's David Hunt. I'm the CEO of Avast Links. For those that know me, I'm incredibly proud to actually work in pharma, and particularly in the creative community that drives healthcare communications. I think that as an industry, we can have a really positive impact on patient outcomes through our creativity. I think we can take real pride in the positive impact we have on society, and simultaneously, we can drive uh, the commercial success for our clients. I absolutely love uh, working in healthcare innovation, and I have done for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And we spend an inordinate amount of time at events like this, and as I do in my own time, really thinking about the metaphorical bleeding edge of healthcare, and particularly healthcare innovations. What we want to do for the next 15 minutes is really look at the other end of the spectrum and look much more at the very literal bleeding edge of health. And we want to start talking about the porters, the nurses, the doctors, and sharing insight into the people who are working every day behind the curtain to have a positive impact on, on patients' lives. And we're going to identify and introduce you to three different themes that we think we should pair in mind when we are developing healthcare innovations to make sure we're getting the right tools in the hands of the people that, that can use them. So we, with that, we launched the uh, Healthcare Heroes book, which is just here. Um, and that features 21 stories of some amazing people. So on there, we have the likes of John Jackson. John Jackson is a porter. He works in Berry Hospital. He makes sure that every single person that comes in his hospital gets a smile when they arrive, know his name, know where they're going. He takes it so far that in the very, very sad circumstance that he's taking a, a child or a baby to the mortuary, he always makes sure that they have a cuddly toy and he always says, good night and God bless. He doesn't do that through any formal training. He just recognises the importance of subjective well-being and also manners. Also, one of the heroes is uh, Teresa Chin. Teresa, um, not that great at digital, um, but she was a nurse and she felt quite isolated. And through that insight and through her energy and effort, she established an online community of over 60,000 nurses supporting each other on a daily basis. In the far top corner, we have Mark Koska. Mark is a beach bum, he would say. He used to love surfing, and he came up with an invention that is estimated has saved nine million lives, the disposable syringe. So for us, these are like everyday heroes who have a really positive impact on their world. The first theme that we really want to introduce you to is, is this concept of vulnerability, and it ties all of our heroes together. For me, to produce the very best work, vulnerability, perhaps even some suffering, is a real necessary evil. It gives us a real insight and it means our innovations can be really meaningful. As I said, I've worked in this industry for 15 years and more times than I care to admit, I've claimed to be a therapy area expert. Um, earlier this year, we published a white paper called um, In Search of the Invisible Army and it's a caregiver's story. And it spoke about not just patients, but actually unpaid carers, husbands and wives, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. And what it illustrated to me was the limit, actually, of my insights into those conditions. And that real insight, real knowledge, comes about through this vulnerability. But what it provides is unbelievable insight and drive in order to move things forward. The first uh, lady we'd like to introduce you to, us to is Jo Milne. Now, Jo's from the North East. She was brought up deaf from birth. She had two sisters who were normal hearing. She was treated exactly as they were. Um, she went to school, she went to a normal school, and she made friends like anybody else would. Uh, but she championed people with disabilities. She taught people how to, how to live with disabilities as well. But in her 20s, her vision started becoming impaired as well. Now, if you can imagine losing the sense it's probably the strongest in your whole body now if you've lost your hearing. That's a pretty frightening state of affairs. Now, Joe actually uh, went into a bit of a depression, uh, but there was light at the end of the tunnel because she was able to have the opportunity to have cochlear implants, which could potentially have saved her hearing. She had the operation. It was a success. And she was also championed by the BBC of this as well. 39 years without hearing. 
Uh, she was championed by the BBC Radio 6 and also GMTV, who did a song for Joe. What, which, they, got, they got viewers to ring in. Which song would Joe most like to hear when she got, if she got a hearing back? As it happened, Dave, have you got the... Can you just do the clicker? We shall show you the moment when they switched her cochlear implant song. Um, I'm very high. Very high. It will sound high-pitched at first. Your brain will readjust it for you. It won't always sound that way. It's all right. It's a big, big, life-changing day today. This video was shared by the BBC and went viral and now has over 12 million views. You can see it's quite an emotional video, actually. But uh, one of her friends who she used to go to school with was uh, a girl called Amina. And she'd gone to live in ba back to Bangladesh. And through Amina and the Hearing Fund, um, which was originally a charity set up by the Osmond family to help there to brothers, I don't know, and you've all heard of the Osmonds, I guess, the band. To, the reason that band was set up was so they could raise money for their two brothers who were hard of hearing. I know I never knew that, but it's an interesting story in the world. But through the Hearing Fund, Joe actually went to Bangladesh and took 500 hearing aids with her to give to children to help them hear. And she witnessed every single one of those hearing aids being switched on. And you can imagine the delight for a young child to hear their mother's voice for the first time. Quite incredible. Now, Joe's still working for the Hearing Fund in Bangladesh and also campaigning to introduce sign language into the national curriculum. She embraces every opportunity. And when she was interviewed um, by the BBC, she was asked what's her favourite noise that she, or what's her favourite sound that she, she can hear and that now she can hear. And she actually said... It's the sound of a baby laughing. Now, I'm pleased to report that Jo is now pregnant and due to give birth to her own child in August, which is really, really positive news. She's engaged to be married to a, to a paramedic and things looking very, very positive for her. For me, um, that, that story is the perfect illustration of vulnerability combined with technology and scientific endeavour and you can see the, the impact it brings. The second uh, theme we want to explore is serendipity, or chance. For me, as an expression, it's really um, open to interpretation how you can perceive this. But fundamentally, it does rely on this concept of chance. And I asked myself, uh, how open is pharma to this concept of serendipity? And I feel like we've made progress over the last couple of years, and what you see now is much more multidisciplinary teams working together in a progressive fashion. Um, we, you know, we might have medics working with engineers, we might have brand managers and patients working with uh, art directors and copywriters. That said, I still feel it's within a very conventional framework. I still feel like it's all, there's a degree of alignment. I'm not convinced we're open to a completely different point of view and the potential positive repercussions that that could bring. So I'm going to quickly share with you a story of a guy called Tom Lynch that absolutely questions my concepts of what a creative multidisciplinary team could look like. Has anyone heard of Tom Lynch? You probably won't have. So when I was growing up, I was really into BMXs, had one of those rally bikes. And my absolute all-time superstar hero was Tom Lynch. He was basically to BMX what Tony Hawk's was to skateboard. He was just nowhere near as good as self-publication and brand building. But nonetheless, he was great. So when we're doing this project, Tom actually featured on the list, and I was really quite excited at the concept of meeting him. And when I did, I was saying, you know, you were traveling around the world racing BMXs, and now you're driving, you're driving ambulances. And he made the point, we can all relate to this, he was getting older and people were getting younger. But the key thing about Tom is in the same way he had defined uh, BMX driving, he was also defining ambulances. So he became a driver in um, the mid-90s, he was working in London, and he, he, he did, and he describes that he loved his job. But he was hugely frustrated with the London traffic and the fact that he was being delayed in getting to people who desperately needed his care. He was totally convinced that in a race across London, his BMX would kick the ass of his ambulance, like, on every occasion. So after loads of lobbying, in 1999, he launched the Cycle Response Unit. 
Here you can see his bike. He, um, it's obviously been customized. Key to it was a lightweight defibrillator, which made a real difference. The very first day that he did this, he knew it was going to be a success. So in the first hour, he got to five accidents. He was able to treat all the patients, referring them to medical centers rather than A&E, and cancel all of the ambulances. I think he describes it best when he goes, these days I'm still racing, only now it's to patients rather than finish lines. His idea is scaled across Europe, it's scaled across Asia and also the US, where a cycle response unit is present, um, they respond to 90% of the phone calls that they receive. For me, it's like the perfect example of what can happen when you expose yourself to chance. A BMX world champion and an ambulance driver, and it's transformed the emergency services. The final theme I want to introduce you to, which I think is the most powerful, is this concept of exquisite risk. For me, we're talking about a worthwhile risk that's designed to perfection, or an experiment that's meticulously planned, or a step forward in evolution where every single detail is considered. So it's worthwhile, and we're planning, and we're going to be a success. And I think that is key to pharma and healthcare and communications and innovation. And I think the perfect example of exquisite risk is Matt's story. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Matt Eagles. I'm 49 years old. Not that's unusual, you say, a 49-year-old man speaking at a conference. However, if I told you I've had Parkinson's for 41 years and I consider myself lucky, then perhaps you might be. Now, the reason I say I'm lucky is that I've got nothing to compare my life with. I haven't had Parkinson's later in life, or I maybe got a family and a good job. Everything I've done growing up with Parkinson's has been from scratch. So everything I've done, I've had to do with Parkinson's. Now, that just means I'm facing different set of challenges, surely. Well, you're exactly right. Well, the f to begin my story, really, the first signs were when I was a young boy in, in, uh, at school. I couldn't stand up in assembly. My head teacher kept on saying, told my mother. She wasn't convinced. She thought it might be uh, arthritis of the knees. That was ruled out. Things went from better to better, to better really, because I was sent to Booth Hall Children's Hospital where I spent a lot of time and was with a lot of experts in the field. Um, and purely by accident, actually, the MRI in Manchester, a guy, a doctor called Dr. Liversidge, put me on Cinemat or L-Dopa therapy. Now, at the age of eight, that's pretty unheard of, I'm sure you would agree. But ironically enough, it worked. And, and to, into the bargain, and this is what I was much more interested in at the time, he actually gave me 50p for the privilege of taking the tablets, which meant a lot to me, and I could buy a lot of stuff with 50p back in the 70s. Um, School-wise, was a bit strange. I went to an old grammar school. Uh, my Latin teacher called me dead legs, uh, and then my history teacher called me sparrow legs, uh, and I had to go from classroom to classroom, and sometimes it was very difficult. And one incident was where my teacher actually told me to let, my, my colleagues had dragged me into the classroom and my teacher made me lie on the floor underneath the blackboard for the whole lesson. But so be it. Things have, have got a lot better, really. Um, I've had, been through a range of tablets. I've taken, I've estimated, about 220,000 units of medication in my career so far. I've had apomorphine. I've had all sorts of things. But probably the most challenging thing I've had is deep brain stimulation, which underwent... 11 years ago this year, and it actually officially makes me bionic and remote control at the same time. Now, I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to switch myself off for want of a better phrase, but this is my kit for, I was going to say, this is my kit for stimulating myself. I don't actually mean it in any other way apart from in a good way. Okay. But that, that's what keeps me going. This has enabled me to travel the world extensively since it, I, I was um, a photographer at the London Olympics, an official accredited photographer. Uh, pff, I've had a great time, really, but however, I have had dodgy sides as well. I mean, I try and make light of my illness by, by really making... When I have a fun, strange situation, as you'll see in a minute, actually, they can just go on to the next yeah. slide. 
This might be quite challenging for a lot of people. This is me trying to eat my dinner the other day. And this is a side effect of my medications. It's called dyskinesia. You also don't like spaghetti either, do you? You've just ruined my gag there, Dad. I was going to, this is my body's way of saying you should never eat super noodles. Never eat super noodles. I was trying to get my son to eat as, as it happened and show him that they really were quite tasty. But it didn't actually work. But uh, on from that, I was lucky enough quite recently, when, I don't know whether this is, how long this is going to go on for, I really didn't like those noodles though. Recently, you'll notice somebody, we've already talked about that, it's Joe Milne. Because at the launch of Healthcare Heroes book, Joe and I were asked by Steve Watts, who's another one of the Healthcare Heroes, and he challenged us to go and walk up Lufrig. And Joe and I accepted his challenge. And this picture here is one of my proudest moments because I've not been able to walk for that long in that state for years. And through meeting these healthcare heroes, I've managed to do that. And that is something for me. Courage, honesty, and an awful lot of guts, I think, go into that. Joe as well. Joe, bearing in mind, she's got tunnel vision now. Only got a peripheral vision. That was a big event for her as well. And we're all together, and it's all come through this Healthcare Heroes book. So I'd like to thank Dave for that, because, <laughs> for including me. I'm sorry. So thank you very much. <laughs>